Robin Hood and his merry men never had the variety of fun available to modern American bow and arrow enthusiasts, particularly those who like to hunt. We not only are blessed with a much larger diversity of wildlife than roam the reaches of Sherwood Forest, but we have greatly improved archery tackle and new innovations for its use. Unless a bow hunter travels from state to state, about the best he can expect in the line of big game is one or two hunts a year. The small game hunter, on the other hand, has something to hunt every day in the year, and to a bowman, any game is big game. For example, the sport of bull fishing for rough or predatory fish, while it doesn't get the publicity that big game hunting does, is increasing greatly in popularity. It's exciting, it's fun, and the basic equipment needed is simple and inexpensive. The great expanse of tide flats and shallow reefs separating the shores of Florida's Key West from the offline Gulf Stream are ideal stalking grounds for the bull fishermen. For when the tide is at ebb, vast numbers of rays move in from deeper water to feed on mollusks and other shellfish. Fred Bear, a winter migrant from snowy Michigan, is here to give the acid test to archery equipment, which his company manufactures. To rig his tackle, he ties the 90-pound test line securely to the harpoon point and then uncoils more line on the seat of the boat. This slack line will minimize drag on the arrow and will take up some of the shock from the first powerful run of a ray. The other end of the line is threaded through the guides of a deep-sea fishing rod and wound on a star drag reel. Two men are needed for this type of sea hunt. One, to guide the boat over the flats, while his partner stands on the bow, ready to cast his miniature harpoon at the quarry. Despite the crystalline clearness of the water, a boat can usually cruise up to within five or six feet of a ray before it spurts ahead. This time, the bull fisherman scores a solid hit, and the ray shoots off in a welter of spray. The bow is laid aside, and the springy fiberglass fish rod is now pitted against the ray's strength. This animal is of ancient lineage and belongs to the same class as the sharks. It has a cartilaginous skeleton, but its jaws are movable and equipped with bone-like plates to crack the shells of the mollusks on which it feeds. Its nervous system is primitive, and it is doubtful that this creature feels any pain or other sensation from the arrow. It simply fights the restraining pressure of the line and the resilient rod. The combined weight of the boat and pressure exerted by the bow fishermen slowly but surely wear down the ray's great strength, and it is brought ever closer to the boat. In bringing one of these large rays into a boat, care must be taken to stay clear of the long, slender tail, for near its base is a strong, sharp spine. This spine is capable of inflicting a serious wound, although it's not an offensive weapon, but rather a means of defense against being swallowed by even larger seagoing predators. Having fought it out with a denizen of the briny deep, we now shift our scene of activity to midsummer on fresh water, this being the Arkansas River near Stuttgart. Although not as clear as the Gulf Stream, nevertheless, we can detect long, shadowy forms basking near the sun-warmed surface. Here again, a trolling-type rod and reel will be used. Stripping a considerable length of line off the fish reel, he threads it through the guides of the rod and then winds part of it on the stationary spinning-type bow reel, which is taped to his bow. Many of their shots. 
sharp teeth protrude outside the edge of the jaws, and they aren't a bit fussy about what or whom they bite. This gar is six feet long, and later weighed in at 128 pounds. Once again, our scene shifts to another region and another time of year. Brightly hued maple leaves smell autumn, the time of harvesting and of hunting in the north. Juicy russet Jonathans, wine saps, and northern spies are picked for the market stall or the cider mill. Automatic corn pickers rapidly fill attached wagons to overflowing with mounds of golden ears. This is the farmland of southern Michigan. Yet 
tracks tell tales which the snows record for the observing. The hunters now travel through woodlands where a scant two months ago they stalked the wary white-tailed deer, protected now from all but the vagaries of weather. Here again, man's faithful companion, the dog, plays an important role. This time, however, instead of the silent, in-sight working of a showy bird dog, it's the long-eared, deep-voiced hounds. Trained to follow scent-filled tracks through the roughest of the thickets, they generally work out of sight, while their masters follow as best they can the exciting sounds of pursuit. The bowmen, trailed by their hounds and wearing snowshoes to stay on top of the soft snow, are headed for the depths of a thick cedar swamp. The quarry they seek is largely a nocturnal creature, that is, it travels and feeds at night, holding up by day in some dense thicket or windfall. A meandering stream marks the edge of the swamp, and caution is taken by men and dogs in negotiating the new ice. No sooner do they reach the other side, when the hounds hit a fresh track and roar off into the swamp, hot on the trail. For a time, the music of the chase is intermittent as the four-footed detectives lose the trail and cast about until they once more straighten out the scent. Suddenly, the baying of the hounds increases in volume and steadiness. Their quarry has jumped from its lair. And then once again, the sounds change, becoming even more frenzied and steady. They're barking trees. Running across the drifts on his snowshoes, Fred heads for the center of action, where an eager hound is saying, Come on, boss, I've got him for you. Sure enough, 40 feet up in a big poplar is the object of all this excitement, a beautifully furred bobcat, the little lion of the North Woods. The bowman circles around the tree until he finds a lane through the branches for his arrow. His first shot goes just over the back of the cat. Knocking another shaft, he takes careful aim, and this time hits the bobcat dead center. The cat leaps out on the limb, clawing to retain its hold, but it's been hit through the heart and falls, dead before hitting the ground. Another fine trophy for the bowman who derives year-round pleasure from his quest for fins, feathers, and fur.